Good evening, everybody. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening. I just wanted to offer a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, you have the chat to the left of the screen where I can see some of you already uh, using that, uh, talking about how Ingrid is a superstar. We agree. Um, we are going to have the chat on for just the beginning in case you have any troubles. Uh, you can let us know in the chat. I also want you to note um, at the bottom where it says live, right under that, it says get audio video help. If the um, audio is laggy or the video is laggy, you can press that and you'll go into compatibility mode and that should help with any buffering issues you have. We also have, um, if you want to learn more about the Eagleton Institute, you can press the little green button below. And just underneath that as well, we have the ask a question feature. So once the chat is closed, you won't be able to type questions in there. Uh, but if you have any questions throughout the program, you can ask them in the ask a question feature. If you like somebody else's question, you can vote upvote that question and we'll be sure to ask it at the end. Uh, so I hope you all feel welcome and oriented and ready to begin the program. We are grateful to partner on this event with the Princeton Adult School. Uh, Princeton Adult School normally offers this program with Ingrid as part of their fall course offerings, and they have allowed us to partner with them so that this program can be even more widely available. So we'd like to thank you, um, Princeton Adult School, and I'll put a link to their um, group in the chat in a moment. Most of all, we'd like to thank Ingrid Reed for conceiving of and coordinating this series and tonight's discussion, what to watch for as the ballots are counted. Ingrid Reed will be moderating this evening's discussion and she's allowing me to offer a very brief bio of her. She served as the director of the Eagleton Project until about 2010 and was a colleague of this evening's panelists. Uh, she will, and she will introduce um, the panelists to you in just a moment. More recently, Reed chaired the board of New Jersey Spotlight and she serves on the community advisory board of NJTV and the advocacy committee of NJ, um, of New Jersey AARP. And now, welcome Ingrid. I can make it work. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you, Kim, uh, for all that you've done to make this possible, working with the public library and collaborating with the Princeton Adult School. It turns out that two of the people who are on the program tonight actually participated in um, the adult school programs on the elections in the past. Uh, and I want to thank people who are returning. Uh, you know that in the first session, we focused on the ballot and what people uh, here in New Jersey uh, might want to know as they prepared to vote. That was in the very beginning. Well, now we are on to a second session where, as you all know, it is less than a week before Election Day, and we're beginning to think about what should we know about this electorate? Every election has a different electorate. And, um, and the four people who, um, who've joined us, the Eagleton experts, as I call them, um, are uh, going to give their, us their insight and information uh, on that sort of general topic of participation and who is participating, who's participating in the election um, based on the things that they've been studying and observing um, and teaching about. So uh, I think it will offer some um, way of, of spending the next few days as you uh, prepare to vote if you haven't or wondering if your vote got counted. So I think of their work, uh, these wonderful experts in, in research, writing, and their commitment to public service reinforces what Florence Eagleton, the woman who made the great gift that made the Institute possible, said in my words, young women and young men need to know about politics and understand it in order for our democracy to work. So I uh, salute them. Uh, I'm going to introduce each one as they speak and we plan to do this in sort of three rounds uh, session. So they won't be speaking for any great length at any one time so that you hear their voice and their perspectives a number of times. So we're gonna start with sort of a factual question. Just as we get started tonight, this week before the election, what current information do we need to know uh, about an election or this election that comes out of their particular um, uh, work? And I've asked Dean Ambar, Associate Professor of Political Science and an Eagleton Senior Scholar to get us started because he recently wrote a book called Reconsidering American Political Thought. And uh, 
it just has to inform your thinking about this election, Dean. And for those people who are wondering, have I seen this man before? Uh, and for those of your fans who are on, I'd like to say that we're really happy that you were a teacher at Princeton High School and had many beloved students <laughs> and their parents. So we're glad to welcome you back to Princeton uh, as a professor. So thank you want to get started? I, I do, and I want to thank you, Ingrid, uh, for your uh, work in, in American democracy, not only in New Jersey, but truly uh, upholding the banner of democratic life and politics uh, for so many of us. So, uh, and I am grateful for that. Um, sure, I think really the first big question uh, I'm concerned with, and I think members uh, of, of your listening audience is concerned with, has to do with what what is this election? What is it about? You know, um, most elections are not critical elections like FDR versus Hoover in 32, or uh, you know, big ideological elections like Reagan and Carter in 1980, liberalism versus conservatism. Most tend to be fairly mundane. You know, 1996, 92. Are we going to have social security in a lockbox? Are we going to expand? Uh, you know, or contract uh, immigration. And, and those are important questions and, and, and they deserve attention. Really and truly, however, this election is an existential election. You know, uh, to my way of thinking, it really is only on par with the election of 1864. And it's a system-based election. It's asking the biggest of questions. What kind of political system are we going to have? What kind of country are we going to have? Are we going to ha have a democratic system where democratic majorities win out and are decisive? Or are we gonna have a more populist, uh, personalist, corporatist style of government? One where perhaps the judicial branch, uh, the Justice Department, the FBI, National Security State are more closely tied to the president? I mean, these are big questions. Um, and I think that's on the ballot. And then finally, I'll say with respect to my, my recent work in American political thought, you know, the United States has had, you know, an implicit problem, one that we're really dealing with now. And it really has uh, to do with one basic question. Can a multiracial democratic society that had been formerly uh, majority white transition to a society that has a non-white majority while maintaining a democratic polity? Or will the transition from that kind of state where white votes in the past have proved decisive, now transition to another kind of state where democracy is no longer really adhered to because the former group is upset with the process that no longer um, you know, upholds their viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an explicit uh, appeal that's made, frankly, by, by President Trump to his supporters that we have to uh, move away from this old style of state because it no longer works for you. And I think that that's the real struggle. I think that's what's on the ballot. I think democracy itself is on the ballot. And um, I wish I could couch it and make it seem uh, more congenial than that, but there's no sense in getting around it. This is a, a really existential kind of election. And I know uh, most, most New Jerseyans are paying close attention to it for sure. Thank you, Dean. And we now need to look at who will be participating in making that decision. Uh, uh, it, will it be a broader electorate uh, um, in age, in, um, in interest, in education than, than the one that we've seen in the past? So I'm going to turn next to Elizabeth Motto, who is the director of Eagleton Center for Youth Political Participation and happens to be a prize winning author for research in this field. There's a lot to be learned. And, and I know she also organizes and plans and organizes the participation of Rutgers students in, in elections, a big job. So as you hear what Dean has to say, what, what is your perspective on knowing something about youth in, in taking on this challenge of figuring out um, uh, what this election is all about? Uh, are, there, are they interested? Can you tell us or... Are you worried? <laughs> uh, all good questions. And like Dean, I really want to thank you, Ingrid, um, not just for involving me in this night, but for the you know incredible commitment you've shown to democratic education, civic education, the work that we do. Um, you certainly serve as a mentor for me and many, many others. Um, so I definitely have uh, a lot of thoughts that I'm happy to share tonight, in, and especially in response to Dean's Dean's intro. I do want to um, share, I do, uh, let me see. I'm just going to try to share my screen. And if not, I can just give me one second here. 
because I have a little bit of data. Um, actually, Kim, I don't think it's letting me share, so I can just wing it if I need to. Uh, yeah, it's not, I don't. Okay. See the All right, then I can wing it. <laughs> All right, we'll then I can wing it. Back. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Ingrid, I would say, you know, I want to start off by making sure um, everyone has a good sense of sort of ground rules or fundamental ideas about mm -hmm. youth and young adults right. and their involvement in politics. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's important to really amplify um, how many young adults there are out there. We're going to hear a lot about millennials and Gen Z. And so I think it's important to have some idea of what, where do these generations begin and end? And mm -hmm. in general, uh, millennials are seen as falling between about hitting about 40 years old or so. So in about wow. their mid 20s to 40s. Yeah, so millennials are getting old, um, mm -hmm. but they're followed quickly behind by Gen Z. Um, and if we look at the Pew Research Center, um, you know, they really look at anyone born after 1996 or so falls on, in that category of Gen Z. So I think what's really important that I always keep in mind and something I'm always telling my students is there are a lot of young adults out there. There are nearly 88 million millennials or Gen Z uh, young adults living in the United States. Um, so just by sheer numbers alone. Um, it's a generation that really has a great potential for power, for exercising power. Um, these are generations that are the most ethnically diverse generation in American history, young adults. So they have a very unique uh, mindset and worldview. Um, I would say it's a generation that is facing some significant challenges. You know, millennials felt the Great Recession like no other generation did, I would say. Certainly student loan debt is something that really burdens young adults right now. Um, and yet they have an incredible skill set um, that previous generations don't have. Often young adults are referred to as digital natives because they have a fluency with social media and the internet, um, and which is a real potential for power, a source of power among young adults. Um, and then the last thing I'd mention regarding demographics, you know, so we really have an understanding of who these young adults are is, we were already seeing signs among the millennial generation that they were more inclined to be engaged in their communities, cared about their communities, wanted to solve public problems, um, but tended to look to, towards volunteering, philanthropy as ways to address public problems. What we're seeing with Gen Z is a, is a very direct interest in politics and political engagement and a real affinity towards um, using the roots of political action, the vote in particular, as a way to affect political change. So we know, you know, as most of us know, young adults do have, their voter turnout rates do lag behind um, older generations. If you're looking at maybe the last 20 to 30 years, um, you know, voter turnout rates for young adults at, for presidential contests usually hover around 50% of eligible young adults. Um, has gone up as high as maybe 51, 52 percent, but in 2016 was 46 percent. So certainly lagging behind um, mm -hmm. older Americans. We can talk about why maybe subsequently. What I'm really looking towards is we have seen those voter turn uh, voter turnout trends on the uptick. 2018 midterms, we saw young adults, you know, doubling voter turnout rates. On the Rutgers campus, thank you for giving us a shout out on the Rutgers New Brunswick campus, uh, Ingrid. We, uh, we doubled our turnout rates between 2014 and 2018 and actually even won a prize for the Big Ten voting challenge. So we'll take, we'll take anything we can get in the Big Ten, any trophy we can get. Um, but so we were looking upon this fall excited, um, you know, feeling as if we really were ready to, to have young adults turn out in great numbers. Certainly the changes to electoral practices this fall are a concern. Certainly the fact that a lot of students around the country are remote, don't have that in-person support from, from their campuses is a concern. However, so far we're seeing really impressive early voting rates and vote by mail rates by young adults. Uh, we know at least 6 million young adults have either voted early or have cast their ballot you know, via mail in some really important states, in Texas, um, in Ohio, in North Carolina. So I think we went into this fall a little concerned, still are working hard to get the vote out, but I think this could be a really game-changing election for young adults too, really catching on and holding on to voting as a route for political power. 
So I lots more to say, but I'll do that in the next round. That, that's a great introduction. And <laughs> Good. Sort of up, upbeat one too. Good. <laughs> Good. Now I want to turn to uh, the representative from the Center for the American Woman in Politics, who's with us tonight, uh, Professor uh, Professor Kira Sambanmatsu, and uh, and and maybe I should I would really like to say that the uh, uh, center is celebrating its 50th anniversary, and for a uh, many of those years, uh, it was directed by Ruth Mandel, who was a member of our Princeton community. And we miss her. She was then the director of Eagleton. But it's a good time to salute her. And I know, Kira, that you agree. That Absolutely. <laughs> it is, it is strange to be here when she's not on this, this yeah. Zoom. And that um, the center values the uh, participation of a professor of political science who has been doing research and writing uh, and has wonderful younger faculty colleagues who are working with you. And I know you're quoted everywhere <laughs> these days. <laughs> so there's a lot to say about women and uh, politics and this election. So I'll ask you to sort of give us some opening words about that. Thank you, Ingrid, for inviting me. And certainly it's been an interesting time for women in politics. And yeah. um, all of my colleagues at the Center for American Women in Politics have been quite busy. Uh, absolutely. So let me, I'm going to try sharing my screen and okay. we'll see how this goes. Um, uh, Kim, it says there are, there's a limit to how many video sources can be on at once. Oh, and if you remove a source, it might work. Shut me down. It's okay. <laughs> no, I, I think we'd have to like get somebody, kick somebody off. I forgot about this. We have to have okay. six spaces. Do you, um, I can't come off. I could remove somebody and then invite them back. Remove me. I can listen. I don't have to be on can, the screen. Can we take people on and off? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Who do I feel? Because I, I would have to remove them entirely. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Elizabeth, do you mind if I um, remove you and then come back to you? Sure. Sure. Okay. You can do the same for me when I'm done. Kim. Okay. So now go ahead. You, you might be able to try and share now, Kira. Great. Yes, that's going to work. <laughs> Okay, just need. Okay. The application window. Application window, and I'm not seeing my application. Let's did you see. have your PowerPoint open? I did, sorry, sorry folks. This is the beauty of being virtual. And live. There it is, there it is, okay. I hope everyone can see that. And um, if you haven't visited our website before, you can get to it through the Eagleton site. We are the Center for American Women in Politics turning 50 next year. We have a treasure trove of data on candidates and elected officials on our site. And um, this election, I want to mention that we've already seen history made with respect to women candidates in that we've seen nominations. So the general election hasn't happened yet, of course, but we already have set records. And we know that Kamala Harris has made history. She would certainly make even more history if the Biden-Harris ticket is successful next week. We've seen a record number of women running for Congress here and a record number of women of color running for Congress as well. You might remember that this election is building on the 2018 election and you may have seen our data in the news and what we saw in 2018, a lot of comparisons to the 1992 year of the woman so-called where we had, if you have a laptop open, you might be able to see this chart I have here. If you're on a phone, it might be a little hard to make out, but we can see that over time from 1992 when there was a record set for the number of women who ran for the US House, that has actually been swamped by what happened in 2018. This year, we're also seeing some new records. You can see that 2018 in particular was a special year for Democratic women, less so for Republican women. Um, but here in 2020, if you can see the red bar here, um, Republican women, more Republican women are running this year. In, if we switch to who won their primaries, we're of course whittling down, but we are still seeing record numbers here. Um, and of course, 2018 and 2020 really 
represent a big departure from past elections. So we're seeing incredible participation by women candidates. At the Senate, we saw in 2018, records for both Democrats and Republicans in winning nomination, uh, in running for the Senate rather. Um, 2020, we're, we also saw record number of women running for the US Senate. Um, not a record for Democratic women this year who have been nominated, um, but a record for Republican women. And just to uh, toggle back to this number, what you can see is a big partisan split here. Women in Congress today, women are about 24% of all members of Congress. They're overwhelmingly Democrats. Um, there's a big partisan imbalance there. One thing to think about um, moving into next week is there is, of course, less focus on U.S. House races because it's expected that the Democrats will maintain the House. Of course, there are some interesting races here in New Jersey, including um, our two women members who are up for re-election and then Kennedy in a uh, challenger position. So we could end up with three women from the New Jersey delegation. That would be a record. But in particular, it's the Senate that is up for grabs and Democrats trying to regain the Senate, of course. And what we see is a lot of women in these marquee races that will decide control of the Senate, um, including several incumbent senators looking to hold on to their seats. They're in tight races and sometimes being uh, met with a female challenger. You've probably also heard a lot of talk about the gender gap, which we can talk about more later on this um, uh, session. But we have on our website, uh, my colleague Claire Gothro has been putting up polls to help us track the gender gap. And you can look at um, all the available polls that are national and also state by state to see what's happening. And we are definitely seeing larger gender gaps in these polls than we have in the past. And like I said, please visit our website and thanks for sticking with me through the technical difficulties. Well, thank you, uh, Kira. And we'll get back to some of those um, uh, statistics and, and how they will be playing out in, uh, in the, the election to come. And now I'd like to turn to Ash Ashley Koenig, who is the director of the venerable Eagleton Center for Public Interest Polling, more than 50 years old, and the first uh, a poll to be uh, actually a part of a university and um, doing it in the public interest, not for um, a... Um, uh, um, uh, somebody who wanted to do a poll. And I know that uh, Ashley teaches about polling and how to do polling. And, uh, and also, I think you might all ask uh, what's going on with polls. And I know that Ashley confers and is part of, of studies to with other pollsters to try and figure out what the polling field is all about uh, as uh, our society changes. So Ashley, what do you think we should be looking at in this uh, election from the polling perspective? Nope. Oh, wait, wait. now yeah, your mic's on now. It was off for a second. You can hear me? Okay, good. Um, you know, I, I think polling has become, uh, you know, this somewhat dirty word and, and there's been a, a level of distrust since the 2016 election. Uh, a lot has happened to the polling industry over the past decade or so. And especially 2016 was consequential for how polls have been interpreted and, and the role that they serve in, in the small D democratic process. Um, and, and so 2020 has caused a lot of uh, fear and anxiety for many people about whether or not the polls will get this right. In fact, we'll be coming out with a press release from the Rutgers Eagleton poll shortly uh, this week, uh, where we asked about, do they trust the polls to predict the winner of the 2020 uh, presidential race? And uh, a lot of New Jerseyans don't don't think they will uh, predict it correctly. So you know there there was this supposed mishap, this this uh, perceived mishap in 2016 that the polls got it wrong. And I think what the industry has been trying to say in the past four years is that's not really entirely true. And I think there there needs to be more of an education of poll consumers as well as the media in terms of how polls should be interpreted. Um, back in 2016. We, we have a, a difference between national level polling and state level polling. Obviously national polls are indicative of the popular vote, but we know that's not how we win elections. Um, actually just popped off from the BBC and it's always you know that light bulb uh, line that I'll say when, when I'm on something like the BBC to explain, you know we crazy Americans have a very different way of how we go about our elections. And it's actually the statewide polls like our own that are much more indicative of the, the electoral college and how elections are won in this country. 
Um, the, the problem was back in 2016, while we saw the national polling pretty much right on the money uh, with the popular vote, statewide polls told a very different story. Statewide polls had a historic error, the largest we've seen in several decades in presidential election cycles of, uh, of about uh, four percentage points. And while that seems small, it was quite consequential where we saw many of the states that were uh, projected to go to Clinton breaking for Trump, and especially that pesky little demographic of education, particularly among white voters, uh, being consequential to a lot of these battleground states ultimately going for Trump, as well as being unable to predict third party voters and, and the shift of late deciders mm -hmm. in 2016. Um, you know, and, and so there was a question of, there were questions of whether these polls were done frequently, frequently enough, done by credible pollsters or whether there just weren't enough statewide polls leading up to election day to capture all of these other variables that were going on. Um, and, and, you know, so the polling industry has kind of taken those lessons from 2016, mainly about the importance of statewide polls. Um, as we know, New Jersey really doesn't have a hat in the ring for presidential elections, given how blue we've been in the past several cycles. So a poll like ourselves um, is not as consequential as other battleground states uh, and, and polling those. So the polling industry has taken that to heart between making sure there are enough statewide polls and, and credible ones at that, and also making sure that we're actively using the statistical tool of weighting to weight to education. 2016 was the first time we really saw a, a huge divergence between non-college educated white voters and college educated white voters uh, in terms of the candidate, um, you know, going four points for Trump versus 39 points for Trump, respectively. And so, you know, now pollsters are trying to rectify a lot of the issues that we saw with 2016. Polls are still a blunt instrument. And I think what really needs to uh, be made aware of is, is we have to pay attention to things like the margin of error. And in fact, when we're looking at candidate head to heads, we're not only talking about the margin of error, but really doubling that margin of error, that plus or minus that we see reported in the media um, to know whether or not the lead is actually a statistically significant lead from what we're seeing. And so 2016, there, there was a lot of narrative around, oh, well, it's 49 Clinton, 47 Trump uh, consist consistently. So Clinton's going to win. She has a 99% chance. And unfortunately, what hasn't really been embraced as of yet is, is the uncertainty and the probabilistic design of polling. Polling is based on simply that. It's based on estimates and it's, it's based on the, the you know, science of probability. And it's also based upon a bunch of subjective decision that, decisions that pollsters make leading throughout the process to get these kind of stone cold binary numbers that we hang our hats on when it comes to being reported in the media. So I would say always make sure you're a good poll consumer. Make sure you're looking to see if a poll is credible and transparent, uh, whether it's reporting things like margin of error, the questions that it's asking, how it's asking them, who it's talking to and how it's weighting that data. Um, also making sure to look at not just one single poll, which could be an outlier, polls are snapshots in time, but rather looking at the bigger picture and overarching stories from multiple polls. And then finally, making sure that you're paying attention to statewide polls, uh, because that is consequential to how our elections are decided. That's a lot. <laughs> and, and do you think that what you're hearing today, uh, uh, that they're, they are actually are, um, um, improved in the way they're they're doing the polls and the way they're reporting them or is it yeah. you know. so, so I think you know we, we have a bunch of challenges we have the challenges and we can talk about some of these later of cell phones mm -hmm. of single digit response rates right mm -hmm. now oddly enough response rates have increased uh, during the pandemic but you know there, there is a higher quality of polling we have a lot of the the biggest pollsters now going into battleground states to make up that statewide polling deficit mm -hmm. you know I, I think there needs to be more of a recognition of, of the uncertainty behind polling. And frankly, there are a bunch of variables that polls just can't account for that can occur on election day, including a pandemic, a new voting system in virtually every state um, and, and voter turnout, of course. And so, you know, polls are not meant to be crystal balls or predictive tools. They're meant to explain to us the the how and the why of, of things. And so, you know, the, the sooner we realize what they're actually meant for and, and less to be some you know, predictive tool, um, you know, the, the better there will be an understanding and an acceptance of polls, especially when they diverge from what actually happens on election day. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll, we'll get back to that. And we'll have some questions uh, about that as we go along. Um, let's circle back and, um, and ask, uh, Dean, uh, based on what you've heard here, uh, do you have a sense of what is motivating a lot of voters? Uh, you you have focused on the the uh, uh, the big question um, 
uh, are are do you feel that voters are getting a chance to really think about the uh, the questions that you think are important, or how how do how do people think about it? It could be young people, women, whites, blacks. Uh, uh, where are the electorate today? If you if you had to make a guess. Well, it's a great question, and I think even before this year, you know, with uh, 2008 and and you know the Great Recession uh, and and the aftermath of that, people were already, I think, more engaged in politics than before. And certainly, Donald Trump's uh, election uh, was a big part of that um, interest in 2016. But we are in uh, an, an unprecedented, and I hate to you know continue to employ, employ that word. I feel like I should put money in a jar. Yeah. But uh, we are in an unprecedented pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, people are home having either lost their jobs or are working from home. Maybe their kids are home or maybe one kid's in school and the other kid's somewhere else. Um, life has come to a screeching halt or been drastically changed, um, frankly, to no one's liking. Mm -hmm. And so voters are not um, immune to that. They are recognizing that. And I think they're more engaged and willing to participate than I've seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so I think these, you know, oddly enough, uh, the cataclysm of, of COVID has returned voters in some ways, yes, to that large existential question, but also back to basics. Mm -hmm. you know, am I going to have a job? Will I be able to put food on the table next month? Will I be able to pay rent next mm -hmm. month or the month after? Uh, when will I be able to return to school because I can't afford tuition if I'm someone who's maybe mid-career and I need to go back. So many plans have been disrupted. And unlike years past when people could dissociate the political process from maybe their personal condition, you know, in America, typically, if someone loses the job, they tend to think, well, what's wrong with me? You know, <laughs> other societies think, well, maybe something's wrong with the system or the structure. When Americans have uh, lost their job, have been forced to be at home, they know there is a political uh, you know, connection to this. Uh, and COVID has brought that home. So I think um, there's a level of activism and engagement that is um, on some level uh, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate that it took a, a you know, a pandemic with so right. much loss uh, to, to be there, but I don't know anyone who's um, hardly paying attention. Everyone is paying attention. So much so that I think people are you know, navigating how to um, minimize their news intake because it can be overwhelming. Uh, but I, I think um, we will see very large numbers. And I think the early vote count seems to suggest that uh, just that, that uh, election day is going to add to what already is a very large yeah. percentage of the population uh, voting. Yeah. You know, when you ask people in, in past years, I know Cliff Zukin did uh, a, a survey in New Jersey about why did you not vote uh, the answer basically for a lot of people that don't vote is that it doesn't make any difference. And it seems as though this year people are not saying that. They think it does make a difference. Uh, and, and the difference is defined by them, of course, but it, that, that there seems to be more emphasis on I need to get in there and have something to say. Uh, Elizabeth, would you say that's true of, of youth uh, as you focused on on the fact that they're seeing politics as a uh, a vehicle for action, for change, and so on. Uh, do you detect that? Can you measure it in any way? <laughs> uh, well, absolutely. And I would definitely agree with Dean, um, certainly from the perspective of young adults getting acclimated and thinking about participating in politics. You know, it's been one teachable moment after another since about March about the role of politics in our everyday lives, about the impact of the actions of office holders. Um, and I think that's coupled with an already um, building interest in political engagement among young adults that we were seeing. Um, you know, and it's really worth mentioning, um, I always push back at the notion that young adults don't participate in, the, in elections or don't vote at the rates that older Americans do because they're lazy, because they're on their phones, because they're, you know, narcissistic, you know, maybe for some, but I think it's really worth emphasizing um, the way the system is built, the way we hold elections in the United States, 
places a particular burden on certain pockets of the populace. And certainly young adults are one of those pockets. Um, the fact that every state has a different set of voter registration and election day practices. Um, and the fact that young adults are transient, they move frequently from state to state or within a state. So that means they have to update their voter registration. They have to get familiar with these new, you know, with electoral law in that state. It's also really worth emphasizing that millennials and Gen Z haven't had the civic education that previous generations have. Um, when quality civic education is offered, um, it's often not offered equitably. Um, it tends to be predominantly white, predominantly higher income, predominantly college bound high schoolers and middle schoolers who are getting the sort of civic education that not just feeds them facts and figures, but really equips them to be engaged. Um, so I think what's exciting, what has been exciting is we're seeing not only this generational shift, again, something that Cliff Zukin has done research on, looking at these different, looking at political participation through a generational lens. You know, I think we have already seen a greater inclination among young adults, Gen Z in particular, um, and to, to link their lives to politics. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier, as Dean sort of referenced too, you know, young adults are very dramatically feeling the impact of politics in their everyday life. Gen Z, you know, our children, grandchildren, you know, they're used to lockdown drills. They're used to, you know, being uh, very aware of how gun control affects their day-to-day -day life. Climate change, um, again, as I mentioned before, student loan debt. So I think there have been so many teachable moments. And then um, coupled with, we're all doing, I think, a better job, campuses in particular, of uh, supporting students and getting them to the polls, helping them understand how to get registered, how to turn out on election day. So I think the combination of these factors really do set young adults up for high voter turnout rates. Um, and again, I'm hopeful just based on these numbers we're seeing um, that that's not gonna be thwarted by the conditions of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's interesting though, though that we've heard and we haven't really seen the evidence yet that for older voters, which have always won the prize for participating, <laughs> they have been affected by the pandemic. They uh, um, mm -hmm. don't have people to help them. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the vote by mail is really for them more challenging. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the instructions very often are not easy. Uh, even mm -hmm. the ability to fill in the little, you know, uh, dot in mm -hmm. black, blue, black or blue, right. all right. of that uh, is, is affecting another generation for a different reason than it isn't affecting the, the younger generation. Um, I'd yeah. like to uh, turn to Kira and see if she can tell us a little bit about women's participation and, and how every election is described as having a, a gender gap. And, uh, and it seems every election has a different way of referring to women. We've been hearing a lot about those suburban women, uh, but I don't think that ever came up in an election before. Have, uh, have people at, at COP been uh, struggling with that piece of participation for women, except they still seem to want to participate at a pretty high level. Um, yeah, it's, there's, my colleague Sue Carroll has done, who's a senior scholar at the center, has done some research on this in the past, and she argues that there's often a media frame that goes along with uh, women voters in any given election. So years ago, <laughs> soccer moms were right. the target. Um, and there's and there are various problems with those media frames. Um, I think what we're seeing this year with women voters is movement away from Trump. Um, and I think there, you know, for some of the reasons that we were just talking about um, and that uh, Dean mentioned with respect to COVID, the economy, you know, these are issues that are affecting everybody in different ways. Um, and we know that women are more democratic than men and they have been for a long time. We first saw the gender gap or the difference in presidential voting uh, support men versus women with women more democratic than men since 1980. So this is not a new concept, but um, what, we're, what we've seen in the Trump era is that he has different appeal with men and women on top of that partisan gap. And so in the polls as I mentioned earlier, we've been seeing some really large gaps. Um, and I think it's, you know, we can look at different demographic groups and we certainly know that women are not monolithic. So democratic women are Biden's biggest supporters. Um, but beyond that, women of color, are strongly democratic and strongly supportive of Biden, the least likely to support Trump. Um, College-educated women 
one of the most likely groups to support Biden. But um, the group that I think maybe comes up when people think about suburbs um, are white women swing voters. And so certainly one of the groups that seems to be moving away from Trump compared to 2016 are white women without college education. You know, he has, the president has particular appeal for men and uh, white non-college educated men. Um, but this is a group that seems to be causing the president trouble. Um, there were some polls out today actually from the Washington Post from the Midwest suggesting, you know, this is one of the groups of women he's having trouble with. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, these are women who have been hard hit by the virus and people are helping their children learn remotely and they are doing health care provision for their families and mm -hmm. they also have been disproportionately affected by the economy. So a lot of interesting gender, race, uh, party dynamics there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I think it's been pointed out in a number of places, this is a youth and women, that young black women uh, are seen to be very well organized to get out the vote, that they seem to be taking a leadership role uh, in getting all parts of the population out to vote. But there seems to be particular energy in, in that. Uh, also, well-educated young black women um, sort of seeing the opportunity uh, of what voting can do. I don't know if that's something that you've seen. And uh, uh, it, it just appears that people are talking about that in, in television and the people who are interviewed. Uh, are clearly uh, energized and and confident. <laughs> it's yeah. nice to see. Well, I think this is a special year for Black women in America because mm -hmm. they have been the backbone of the Democratic Party, even though the Democratic Party often takes their votes for granted. And mm -hmm. so I think with Black Lives Matter and all the activism that we that we see today and we've seen throughout the year, these are um, issues, these racial issues that we're seeing are extremely relevant to young people and to, I mean, to all Americans, but it mm -hmm. is definitely driving a lot of interest and mobilization. And with Kamala Harris, um, in the running here, there's particular interest in the Biden-Harris ticket in particular. Right. So, Ashley, is what what are you are, are what we've been talking about now? Does that sound like what you're finding out in the polls? <laughs> yeah. So, I think you know we we've seen this unprecedented, sustained lead of Biden. Um, I I believe since 2017, he has led virtually every head-to-head -head in national polling averages. Uh, with maybe the exception of one against Trump. And, and so what's really propelling this is a couple of things that everyone has mentioned. Um, we see a, a white suburban flight, particularly among white suburban women, uh, toward Biden. And, and the shift for, among white suburban women uh, began in 2018. And so th this is a, a vote that obviously Trump had been, he knew he was in trouble from polling over the summer. He had tried to court them uh, at the convention, but with a, a somewhat antiquated um form of who, who lives in the suburbs, what the suburbs are about, not recognizing how diverse the suburbs are now. Uh, and, and so that has really been distasteful for suburban voters who have been going towards Biden. Biden is also making up a lot of that gap with non-college educated white voters as well. Interestingly enough, however, um, Trump has made some small inroads with both Hispanic voters and black voters, males in particular, which could prove to be consequential in states like Florida and Arizona. So there's almost been a very interesting flip between the two candidates. But of course, the support we see for Biden has been outweighing those those inroads among Hispanics and blacks that, that Trump has been seeing. Um, and, and so I think these are a lot of the, the key demographics that have been popping out in the polling as we lead into the final six days. And now it's just a game about who is actually turning out and going to turn out. Um, Dean had mentioned uh, about those who have already voted. And, and in our own poll, we actually find about 50% of New Jerseyans say that they actually have already voted um, and, and heavily leaning Democratic as of right now. I was going to ask if anybody had any observations about um, New Jersey. Uh, uh, Kiri, you mentioned that we might have three women in Congress, which is truly unprecedented. <laughs> you can, it's not just something you throw off and say, oh, that's unprecedented. It really is. Um, but uh, it, it seems as though uh, if you're up close to the campaigns as we are in New Jersey, because we do have some very competitive congressional races, that it's been difficult for the Republicans to know how to appeal to voters of why they should vote in uh, um, 
for for the president again their message doesn't seem to be able to be clear and uh, and targeted at these various um groups that you've been discussing or describing uh so is that something that um you would feel it could be saying that na nationally that that the that biden's message is clearer to where the voters are than than trump's in terms of uh asking for another four years anybody want to weigh in there i i would just one one interesting poll i don't remember the numbers off the top of my head but COVID here in New Jersey is one issue um, because we have been, we led that unfortunately um, when it hit the United States and Biden supporters are much more concerned about COVID, Trump supporters less concerned about COVID. And of mm -hmm. course now we're seeing the disease spread to all states regardless of partisan loyalties. But um, you know, I think that that is part of the problem is um, you know, Republicans all across the country, to some extent, are running against a Democratic headwind. And um, I think it's specific to location, though, because I think in some areas, Trump is still very popular and you have Senate candidates still sticking with him, for example, and feeling that that will benefit um, their candidacy. So it seems to be partly regional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's it's now 10 minutes before we are supposed to conclude. Kim, do you have any questions? Um, from our listeners or viewers, whatever, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to send some our way. Yes, I'm happy to. Uh, so uh, one question is, how long do you think we will have to wait until we know who will be sitting in the Oval Office in February? <laughs> okay, who wants to take that? We started with you, Dean. Do you want to try that? Well, yeah, you know, um, I'd rather not, but... <laughs> um, but because I was so wrong in, in 2016, but why not go for it again? Um, look, we're going to hear from a, a handful of states earlier than others. And some of those states will be key battleground states. So, you know, Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, Florida, uh, Ohio, um, will have the ability to report larger numbers earlier based on how they are handling early and mail-in ballots and so forth. So I think uh, those states will be some to look at. You know, we, we may not get the full results from those states, but we will get a larger share uh, of the numbers from those states early on. And again, it may not prove decisive, but if you hear, for example, that uh, the race looks really tight in Ohio, that's not a great, uh, you know, uh, you know, portender for, uh, for a Trump victory. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the same is true for Arizona. If you hear that, you know, Biden seems to be you know, really holding holding a lead in Arizona. Well, that's that's a state that you know Trump can ill afford to lose, and, and so on. So there will be about five or six of those states uh, to look at, and it is possible. I do believe, um, perhaps more than we would want to admit, because so many uh, political scientists and commentators were burned in sixteen that you know we're ready yeah. to even you know tell you what, what the weather is tomorrow. But yeah. um, in all fairness, there is a chance that we'll know on election night. Uh, if it's a wave election, if there if it's a, a large Biden victory, uh, and there seems to be some chance of that, maybe uh, less than fifty percent, but not an unreasonable chance. And so, um, for those of you that want to get to bed early on election night, I count myself among them. Um, you know, um, uh, not to display a rooting interest, but you know, some extra sleep in COVID times is always always helpful. So that's, that's a possibility. Right. Any other um, comments about that? Uh, I, I guess, uh, Dean, a lot of people think you're right and they, they agree that we should know at that time. The question is, will what we know determine what people think should happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, and every day that seems to be more of a question. Um, and, but it, probably if it's, as you say, um, quite overwhelming, it might be not as contentious, but we'll know. And just finally on that, um, we don't know what the president will say and when he will say it on election mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, and, and that, you know, opens up another kind of Pandora's box potentially in terms of how the electorate views what happens, his supporters mm -hmm. view what happens. And, um, you know, no one wants to go down that road, but obviously it, it's, it's a po stark possibility mm -hmm. that the president could say or do anything on mm -hmm. election day or evening yeah that will shape subsequent events, irrespective of what the count is. And so um, 
it's incumbent upon all lovers of our democratic republic to um, mm -hmm. display caution and patience and also uh, do some real truth telling on election day and evening uh, mm -hmm. to thwart any uh, efforts to uh, undermine the popular right. voice of the people. Kim, do you have another question for us? I do. Uh, Susan asks, and I just want to remind everybody that if you have a question, you can um, ask it in the ask a question feature at the bottom. I'll also turn the chat back on. What is the turnout uh, for non-college millennials, comma, Gen Zs? The vote, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and I would say, you know, so certainly, as I said, on average, if we're looking at, um, you know, voter turnout among young adults for the last 20 to 30 years, you know, it really does hover around 50% um, or lower, you know, in the 40s or 50s. I think, un I mean, much like all voters, you know, as I referenced earlier, uh, the way we hold elections tends to benefit certain segments of the populace. Um, and the way in which we hold elections tends to benefit those with resources, whether it's time or income or education. And I would say that's no different for young adults um, uh, than other age cohorts. So I think certainly young adults who uh, have more education, certainly so an important factor to keep in mind is, again, not just unique to young adults. Mobilization matters a great deal when it comes to that final push that a potential voter needs, whether or not they've been contacted by a campaign, by a party. So one of the, the way in which I think that affects young adults is campuses, uh, I'm sorry, uh, well, campaigns fish where the fish are. There are a lot of young adults on college campuses. So when young adults are mobilized by campaigns, by parties, they do tend to go to college campuses. Um, so um, I would say certainly when you're looking at voter turnout rates among young adults, um, they do favor uh, students who uh, either have education or are in college, um, either because they have the resources they need to access the vote or they're mobilized um, in ways non-college youth are not mobilized. And another one? Uh, yeah, the final question we have um, at the moment is do you think the same people go to all the crowded rallies for Trump? That's Adelaide. <laughs> do you think our panelists would know the answer to that? <laughs> I'm going to excuse them unless they really want to ask. <laughs> that kind of for proposition, Ingrid. If, if that's the case. Um, I, I would like to ask you to think ahead. Um, we really have had a very different voting practice or voting season. And uh, the flexibility of vote by mail the in New Jersey, the convenience of somebody sending you the ballot um, the uh, that you could go at any time. We have not had the flexibility of early voting, but if it works in other places, I, I, I imagine New Jersey will have to do something about making it possible to stand in line at seven in the morning on a Thursday <laughs> before election day and, and vote if that's what you want to do. Um, uh, thinking ahead, would, would that be something that you would like people to do more research on and to explore? Do we need to open up this process if we really want participation? I mean, I know that yes or no is a very definitive answer in, in relation to that question, but, um, but voting is, run by law and it is a political process. It depends on who's in office basically who makes the rules. So I'm just sort of interested in what we can look at if we do a uh, favor, if we do promote participation. What do you think? Well, I would say there's already, uh, there already before 2020 was plenty of research to demonstrate that those states that had electoral law, whether registration practice or elected election day practices that made the vote more accessible, the result was higher turnout rates. You know, so for example, states that have same day voter registration always have higher voter turnout rates than other states. Certainly that's the case for young adults, but not just for young adults. Um, and I would say too, um, you know, there are some states, Washington and Utah, which are very different politically that have had completely vote by mail, and, you know, have, have held elections entirely vote by mail in past years. And so one leans right, one leans left. And I think what, you know, the, the research has shown is not only 
do um, does it favor voter turnout rates, but voters like it. Once they get used to it, they really like it. So I think we've let the, you know, now that we've gotten a taste of having more access to the ballot, um, I think, you know, and no, New Jersey had already leaned in that direction by having right. automatic voter registration, online voter registration, you know, voter registration rates skyrocketed in New right. Jersey, thanks to that. So now that we've seen what the effects can be, um, I would say it would be hard to go backwards and I would think it would be a shame to go backwards. The other benefit I would say is it's really prompted a lot of organizations. We've already done that Rutgers University, but because of all of these changes, there was a really good public education system put in place this, this fall to really get voters prepared and mobilized. So I think that's been another benefit too, not just the ease of, of the access to the polls, but really um, having a multifaceted um, uh, campaign to get people to the polls. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? I will offer a little sneak peek from our uh, current statewide poll. About seven in 10 New Jersey registered voters do support making it easier to vote by mail. Uh, although, like I said, in terms of who's already voted, it's about a 50-50 split in terms of those who plan on voting by mail or have already voted by mail versus those who have voted in person. So that's a little, that's a sneak peek that hasn't been published yet. <laughs> so there is widespread support. It's, it's you know, about half of the, the voter population that's actually embracing it. Mm -hmm. uh, any other comments? Kira, do you have any thoughts? Unfortunately, a lot of places don't look like New Jersey, as we know. And I think it goes back to the question that um, Dean was tackling earlier about when we will know the results. Um, I think the voter suppression issue is really dramatic and troubling. And in a democracy, everyone's vote should count. And so I right. think what we're seeing in a lot of places with the long lines, the um, cracking down on when ballots are going to be counted and, and which, whose ballots right. are going to be counted in different states, you know, it's, it raises questions, I think, about where this country is going in the future. And partly that will depend on who wins the election, because you have a president who is um, basically spreading conspiracy theories about different um, right. levels of fraud that don't exist. So it's a very scary time, frankly, for uh, our, pro our election processes and um, even having your vote counted. And I think it's been a wake up call to a lot of Americans about what's been happening where um, the voter suppression issue and um, a lot of the voter ID laws and different things that have been disproportionately affecting minority voters across the country for some time. I think this is now uh, people are seeing more broadly um, what these issues are and how important it is who, as you mentioned, Ingrid, right. who makes the rules, right? right? What the laws are and, and, and which um, courts are going to be looking at these different issues. Right. So it, with, with change comes the, the opportunity to do things better, but also to uh, change the rules in a way that limit uh, opportunities as opposed to expanding them. Uh, it's Dean, a very sad. It's a very yeah, sad situation. Yeah, right. I, I, someplace they have to require a witness for um, um, absentee ballots or even notary in some places. I mean, if that's not voter suppression. So, uh, Dean, you had the first word to start. Do you want the last word now? <laughs> We're going to say goodbye to our listeners. Do you have any other observations? No, just that I would encourage people who have not voted uh, to do vote uh, on a, whether it's election day or uh, early ballot, whatever the case may be, do exercise your right. It's a precious right, the most precious right we've had. Uh, many have shed blood over the years, over centuries, to guarantee that all Americans have that right. Do not take it for granted. I know your listeners won't. won't. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but it right. can't be said often enough and too vociferously. Please go out there and exercise your right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, thank you for, for listening. And thank you, Ingrid, for hosting this. And thank you to all, all four of you experts from Eagleton. Go on Eagleton's website, look at their public programs. It's a great service to New Jersey. But now with doing it this way, you can tune in and participate at Eagleton from any state in the United States or abroad. <laughs> so it's a real opportunity. And we appreciate all you do, all your thinking, and, uh, and also your focus on the next generation, even young ones like your little Will, Ashley. Who was on <laughs> earlier, so. uh, and thank you to everybody who's tuned in. We hope this gives you some more to think about. Uh, as you vote, value your vote, and also vote yourself if you haven't, but also see if you can find two or three other people who you can convince that it's really important and it does make a difference. 
So thank you again. And for those who are interested in the topic, join us two weeks from now as we explore what happened and we look ahead to New Jersey in 2021 because we vote every year in New Jersey. We have to get ready. So thank you to you four and thank you to all who listened and watched us. Thank you. Thank have you, a Ingrid. wonderful evening. Thank you.